conversion of the astrophysical black hole. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. I thank the organizers for inviting me. This is my fifth time to Taiwan, but the first time to Xinjiang, so I'm wow. rather happy to be here. Okay, also I thank the organizers for allowing me to speak on rather different topics. So, um, unlike uh, the, uh, this morning's and perhaps yesterday's uh, harder physics stories, I try to talk about more astronomical and astrophysical uh, topics. Okay, I have three topics, and first I talk about the origin of supermassive black holes. Even today we had a new, uh, fresh news, so uh, that's gonna be nice to be, uh, to catch up. Okay. And then I try to relate uh, some of our recent results to the, uh, the gravitational wave sources, namely the uh, formation of binary massive black holes. And then if time allows, I talk about the, uh, the Formation and the existence of intermediate mass black holes. They are all astrophysically interesting topics. <clears throat> the first one, this is well known already. Uh, two years ago, the uh, astronomers Wu uh, et al. they found a very distant object uh, from us, about uh, more than 12 billion years away, and it has a uh, uh, I'm sorry, it's 12 billion solar masses and nearly 13 billion light years away. And the, uh, the, this faint object, okay, the, this is actually very luminous because this looks like this. That is very far. So in fact, if we look at this uh, spectrum, that is literally very luminous compared to the ordinary uh, black hole uh, object, which we call quasar. Okay? So this uh, luminosity and the black hole mass <coughs> is again extraordinary compared to the other local black hole. <clears throat> All right, so essentially we are saying something like this is uh, the epoch, the re literally the edge of the universe we can see in the visible light, and this is us, the telescope, and uh, there is a neutral gas of hydrogen, uh, in which uh, eventually uh, quickly uh, converted into ionized gas, and this object is, lies just in between this transition field, which we call the cosmic zone. So why this uh, object is so interesting? If we plot the uh, observed black holes in this mass and redshift range, so this is the big one, the time goes to this reaction. So we interestingly, we mostly see, because of this uh, observational bias or effect, we mostly see black holes uh, more massive than one billion uh, solar masses. But the curious thing is, also the time uh, uh, elapses over uh, 10 giga years, the apparently the black hole mass doesn't really uh, evolve. So we all almost always are looking at very monstrous objects. Okay? So the question is how, okay, of course, uh, right after the Big Bang, there was nothing. There was maybe a sea of light element and dark matter. There's really nothing. But however, as soon as even before one giga year has passed, there were already many objects with masses over a billion solar masses. So we usually assume there are something which we call some seeds, and then these seed black holes grew, possibly the so-called supercritical uh, rate. <coughs> so this is a big problem in astronomy. So uh, this is one question. A black hole, a massive black hole exists even at the center of our galaxy. So this is a position of a of such a, uh, for now, hypothetical object, hypothetical massive object. But uh, the existence is uh, very clear if we look at this picture. So this is the uh, monitoring of this, the star's orbit over 20 years or so. And if we uh, integrate, this is really the observations of these individual movement of these stars near the galactic center. Then if we uh, integrate these orbits and make these uh, closed ones for each uh, uh, star, then we can directly, almost directly, or kinematically infer the existence of about 4 million solar masses in black hole. So this is strong evidence for the existence. Okay. More direct evidence for the existence of massive black holes came from this uh, detection of gravitational waves from uh, binary black hole models. This time the masses say, I would say only 30 solar masses, but this uh, Tens of solar masses in black holes is very hard to, 
to produce if we follow a standard uh, uh, stellar formation evolution theory. So the, uh, this, uh, of course, the detection of the gravitational wave itself is very interesting and important, but the existence of such massive object is uh, uh, another highly asked, interesting question in, in astronomy. So let's, let me come back uh, to this uh, first question. There are, theoretically, there are three possible pathways to form or to see the formation of supermassive holes. So usually we have, we start from a dark matter, a halo, a clump of dark matter, and then there is a gas inside it. And the, the, the fate of the gas can be uh, classified into three. One is like producing ordinary <coughs> stars, not the ordinary stars, just you can imagine sun, for example, or maybe 10 times more massive than the sun. And the, the other is the entire gas uh, cloud, suppose maybe 10,000 to 100,000 solar masses collapses to a single point. The other one is this gas within dark matter halo can, uh, can undergo a vigorous fragmentation to produce small stars. And then these small stars maybe eventually uh, uh, merges together dynamically to produce the mass of the whole. Okay? So at least for uh, seeding the formation of the very massive object, we, are, we have three promising pathways, and I try to uh, investigate one by one. One question is, okay, so you might believe, okay, a black hole can swallow anything, but not really at any rate. The growth of a black hole is really physically uh, limited by the so-called Eddington rate. So Eddington luminosity is simply, uh, look at this picture, there's a black hole. And as the black hole swallows the gas, it, it can't stay very quiet. It must emit some uh, light or anything. Okay. So if we take the standard uh, models, the black hole typically shines, or to be precise, the circumstellar uh, disk really shines. So this radiation force at some point can balance this gravity. So the, uh, when the, uh, a black hole uh, shines at this plane, and then this, uh, its, uh, its growth is uh, holding, essentially. And we can easily calculate, because you know, these are all the fundamental constants, like gravitational constant, proton mass, and so on. We can get, for any mass of the black hole, this typical growth time scale is just about 40 million years. So in the early universe, when the age of the universe is just, uh, say, 100 million years or so, there aren't enough time for any mass of black holes to grow multiple uh, e-folds. This is a significant problem. Sorry. <clears throat> now, this is a, a simple picture. This is time from left to right. Okay? So this is the big bang, the beginning. And then if we say, suppose we, we, if we distribute black holes with a variety of masses from 100 to 100,000 solar masses, and suppose they all evolve at the critical Eddington rate, then they are gross curves like this. Whereas the observed black holes are already here, like you know, when the age of the universe is less than 1 billion years, the observed ones have already this uh, large masses. So typically, we need black hole seas at least 100 solar masses. And um, um, even better, if we start from uh, a more massive black hole, because this is like really physical limit. So it's certainly, uh, we, we really need to think about the, the actual growth rate is uh, subcritical. Okay. <clears throat> in, in this epsilon 0 0.1? 0 0.1, yeah. Can change a little bit, but uh, this uh, only shift a little bit. All right, so the overall structure formation is like this. Uh, as, we, uh, as you know, the, uh, in the, the cosmic structure uh, formation is driven by gravity, but uh, from the uh, tiny density fluctuation, you form dark matter halos and so on. Okay. But typically, this takes, well, like uh, billions of years. So. so we need to do something to make uh, <laughs> formation of supermassive object happen. Okay, one key ingredient, that is a kind of new idea, or that's our most recent work. So one uh, key element is this uh, baryon acoustic oscillations, which we observe as, say, C and B, right? 
this uh, CMU temperature fluctuations at this angular scale is really like we are seeing this uh, variant of acoustic oscillations. This is corresponding to this <coughs> characteristic Doppler peak in this far spectrum. And the same fluctuation we see in the temperature fluctuation, that is actually generating a strong uh, streaming motion of gas or barium with respect to the dark mode. Okay. So this is uh, one of the uh, observations almost directly seen by these uh, uh, measurements. So uh, the essence is there are a strong winds in the outer universe like this. So this is again the uh, uh, density distribution, say literally cosmological volume, just like CMUs we see. The corresponding velocity field is like this on the, on the left panel. So in the red part, there are like, uh, even like supersonic motions of barrier with respect to dark matter. It turned out this supersonic motion is really very important to, uh, to generate a uh, very massive object. This is a result from our uh, recent work we're published in Science. So this is dark matter halo. Uh, somehow, I mean, yeah, this doesn't work. And uh, this okay. <coughs> is a dark matter halo with about one million solar masses. The gas is still moving. This is at the cosmological velocity. Sorry, the velocity is 90 km per second at the recombination level. But now at this time, <coughs> now at 2 km per second. So uh, the gas is still moving, and uh, a part of the gas can be trapped by the strong gravity of this dark matter halo and generating strong random motion and then uh, making uh, the say, embryo or the star nurseries at the very center. Because, the, uh, because of the supersonic gas motions, the resulting gas cloud is like highly turbulent, like this, uh, the, just like the local uh, star forming regions. So uh, in fact, because of uh, radiative cooling, this is the gas evolution in this temperature and density plane. The gas evolves on a relatively low temperature. Conventionally, theorists wanted to have a very hot gas cloud to, to make a very rapid collapse to form black hole. But in our model, we don't need this uh, peculiar path. This is really like a usual hydrogen heavy gas <coughs> with radiative cooling. However, because of this strong turbulence, when the gas cloud collapses, it really collapses very fast to produce a very massive black hole like this. So we follow this, uh, the growth of this object as a function of time over typically a million years. And then the solar mass grows from, uh, say, 10 solar masses to all the way above uh, 100, near 100 solar masses. Because the gas cloud is highly turbulent, uh, the gas mass accretion, this is the essential growth rate, is highly stochastic. Okay. So because of this stochasticity, the central star uh, switches on and off like this. So here, on phase, the stellar radiation to this direction because there is a circumstance like this. And from time to time, to time the radiation is shut off because of this uh, stochastic mass info from the surrounding. Now it's really like uh, emitting strong radiation. And then stop and then forming even neutral gas. So the, because of this variety, even though the center of the star has now over a thousand solar masses, the, uh, the radiation from the star cannot really stop the infalling gas. The gas can really uh, stream in to this object. And the object, the center of the star, becomes bigger and bigger as time goes on from left to right. And eventually, you know, sometimes, say when it has some, uh, enough time, then it can launch this radiation toward, uh, say, necessarily up and downward with respect to this distance. The remaining thing afterwards is the, this uh, massive object with about three to four hundred thousand uh, solar masses. <clears throat> the evolution of such a massive star while uh, accreting the surrounding gas has been already explored uh, last year by our group. And this is a typical core evolution. This is like a typical stellar temperature. So for this kind of accreting star, the, uh, the, uh, the center of fuel or hydrogen exhausted 
about, say, between um, when it's mass, it exists 100 solar masses or so. Then if we look at this uh, density and temperature plane, the core evolution typically evolves like this. And this part is like so-called general relativistic instability region. Okay? Uh, for some cases, it, it actually avoids this general relativistic instability. But in any case, it goes to this uh, core collapse region. So the resulting uh, remnants are the black holes with mass, say in this case, 100 solar masses or 200 solar masses and so on. So actually, this, in this case, the, uh, even though many things can happen at the end of the stellar blow up, stellar evolution, the strong gravity really makes the entire star to be uh, 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 a black hole with the same mass. So conventionally, people thought about maybe this is again the, uh, the uh, schematic diagram of the uh, supermassive black hole growth. From time goes from left to right, maybe starting from a stellar mass black hole all the way to this uh, one billion solar mass object, or starting from a very hypothetical massive object at a uh, nice time. But our new model really predicts the uh, formation of this massive object as early as the cosmic age is about 100 million years or so. But this really doesn't have to happen too often. Maybe you know, one for a very large area or so. Because the observed supermassive black holes are not that many. So interestingly, the relative number density of this object we found is very close to the observed number density of it. So it is natural to uh, expect these were the reading the origin of these mass robots. And uh, furthermore, the uh, growth rate can be just about 50% of the critical rate. So we don't really need a super critical or some unphysical things. So <laughs> the next frontier will be probably to uh, detect these uh, uh, say progenitor objects. Because apparently we observe only this, the final object. But the prospects are good. In two years, this James Webb Space Telescope will be launched, and it has a capability of detecting even smaller black hole objects. And <coughs> even this, uh, this morning or today, we had a fresh news that the most distant black hole was actually found by the uh, German National Roman. So this kind of quest for the most distant object don't continue, and uh, we can eventually prove how these uh, monstrous objects were formed at the age of, at the cosmic age of one billion years or so. Okay. So this was uh, the, uh, today's uh, nature paper. All right, and then I uh, 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 pose a question about how did, yes? Oh, oh. Right. Just curious, one billion super mass. Yeah. Today you talk about one million. Yeah, but you know that one billion. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this, uh, the growth part, you know, we really need to this part. That's where. Oh, okay, this Yeah, 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 yeah. This is like, you know, four orders of magnitude. Uh, so we need to connect, but the, both theoretically, but the first observation is possible. All right? <clears throat> now the question is, uh, at a much lower mass scale, but this is still a very uh, interesting mass scale, I would say. So somehow why we detected many of these things, many of these twins, above, say, 10 or 20 solar masses for the first time, actually, because what we knew about the galactic stellar populations, but mostly by X-ray surveys, we knew the existence of black holes with about 10 solar masses. That's fine, because we know there are uh, say, massive stars that can leave these uh, 10 solar mass uh, objects. So. However, beyond that, uh, massive stars are actually very rare. In fact, uh, even in our entire galaxy, we know only a handful of these uh, with mass uh, significantly above 100 solar masses, so like this. Sorry about this Japanese, but this is like uh, 100 uh, solar masses, and this is, for uh, example, pistol star, and so other like these, or number. And so we only know, say, a handful of these things, and uh, e even in the entire universe, there aren't many of these uh, very massive stars. We have a good theory, or uh, we have a good reason for that. So, for very massive stars, and they should be like this. So there would be a strong stellar wind. So 
they can't remain as massive as say hundred solar masses. Because if the star contains a lot of heavy elements like iron and silicon, then eventually this, uh, the end of is lost from the star. So this is the modern stellar evolution calculations for the progenitor mass of 20 to 100, 140 or so. And this is the remnant mass. This diagram or result shows if we want to have, say, 30 solar mass or 40 solar mass in the point as the, after the evolution of a star, the stellar metallicity must be as low as the hundredth of solar metallicity. That's something we actually haven't seen, such a low metallicity star. Beyond that, whatever it is the, with the heavy element content, it should lose the outer envelopes. They can't remain as heavy as they were. So what we need is a low metallicity environment, as low as 100th of a solar metallicity. So not, not necessarily zero metallicity, but we, th we feel Maybe zero metallicity is really, in many, namely our universe is the ideal place to produce these massive stars. So we need, we need a little bit of uh, numerical experiment, just like this uh, supersonic uh, strong velocity case. Even with the modest streaming motions that were left over from the Big Bang, we found sometimes these giant filaments okay, extending over 50 particles. So this is gas cloud. Again, like it looks like a giant filament shape. Okay. The gas temperature and density evolution, again, looks similar. So this is ordinary hydrogen heavy gas. But because of this uh, uh, filamentary structure, they can actually uh, fragment into multiple objects. So this entire filament, filament has a mass of 1,000 solar mass or so. But once it goes a vigorous fragmentation, they leave about 100 solar mass clumps. This is a typical ideal object for uh, massive black hole formation as their element. The evolution of this filament looks like this, like this, dynamically. So the gas collapses toward the center, but these remnant stars dynamically interact. Sometimes they, they are, uh, one is kicked out dynamically, like this. So this is like a small star cluster. And then, as you say, one, I can, I can show one second. Like this, you see some of this, uh, the dynamical interaction of the massive star, which we actually follow very accurately, then the ejection can happen. Like this. And at the very center, the, some multiples are formed. For example, what we found, found was this binary one, it has a pair of stars with mass 80 solar mass, 100 solar masses, also, with a separation of 14 a a very nice, uh, say, a promising candidates for as uh, gravitational wave sources. The other one, even nicer uh, a combination of mass, like 60 or 70, just like we expect to, uh, to have detected by LIGO, and then with a high eccentricity, so with a little bit larger separation. So, so if this kind of object has uh, had to be uh, produced or generated in many places, then uh, we can naturally expect by the present day universe, they uh, go to these mergers and generate, uh, produce these uh, strong gravitational waves. So this is definitely, maybe, of course, not all the gravitational wave sources are produced in this way, but this is one promising way to, say, generate naturally this kind of systems. Can you uh, explain the merging with slide Oh, the rate is very high because, uh, okay. <coughs> When we say this like modest streaming velocity, this is essentially in volume it's like two sigma or so. That's it. So uh, about uh, between sixty percent to seventy percent. So. so about one or uh, one tenth of the volume, this kind of thing uh, should be formed. But how long is this filament and so on? We haven't calculated. So the rate is very hard to actually determine. What's the time scale of this? Oh, this is like typically a few million years because the st stars actually otherwise die. Yeah. Typically a few million years. <laughs> All right. Um, finally, we also explore this dense star cluster evolutions. This is the final path, and it's actually the relatively least explored path. 
So again, from uh, cosmological simulations, we identify these uh, star-forming regions like this. And there is a like, dark area, respective dark area. And then we replace these gas clouds with a uh, number of stars like this, following the sort of standard prescription. And assuming sort of ordinary stellar mass function, just like uh, the present day universe. And then we follow dynamically this uh, evolution of these dense star clusters. Essentially, for this kind of calculations, we follow the orbits of individual stars very accurately. And right now, there are like massive stars like here and here and so on. About like, uh, a few hundred uh, stars within this region. And well distributed. But as time goes on, there uh, occurs a mass segregation. The massive ones sink fast and start colliding with each other to produce more and more massive ones. Like this. But this is quickly getting bigger and bigger. Again, within the, the, the within a few million years. So this is typical. Uh, the end, end product is like a very massive object, about one thousand solar mass black hole, and uh, say surrounding low mass star they are surviving because of this mass segregation. The massive ones sink fast and then collide or merge quickly. The mass evolution looks like this, uh, like logarithmic growth. This is time, one million years, two million years, three million years. In our case, we explore, explore a variety of cases. Typically, it ends up with uh, 1,000 or 2,000 solar masses. This is the, uh, the overall cluster evolution. So the star cluster first shrinks significantly and then stays the same. And within this period, the uh, vigorous uh, collisions occur at the very same time. <coughs> Interestingly, if we compare this uh, resonant black hole mass and post halo mass in this way, very uh, many orders of magnitude. So these are like locally observed uh, the so called Magorian relations, black hole mass and bulge mass relations. When we can extend all the way down to this uh, star cluster masses, and these are our results. So somehow, I don't know, physics or nature prefers the black hole mass and the host halo mass. Uh, it lies on the straight line in this way. So uh, I, mean, I, I don't have a very good explanation, but somehow we find this. These are like all observations. This is the fair wave time calculation. It's very interesting. Why, they, why is there a big gap in between those two clusters? Uh, we can't really observe this. <laughs> And detecting these so-called intermediate mass black holes is the next uh, problem. And then, the, actually, the next slide is one possibility. So uh, in many ways, dynamically or in, in any wavelength observation, it's very hard to detect the intermediate mass black holes. But one possibility uh, is explored by one of our students, Kawana. So he tried to simulate the tidal disruption of a white dwarf by uh, intermediate mass cloud, say, suppose this is uh, 1,000 solar mass cloud hole. Then as the uh, uh, compact white dwarf approaches, then it's tidally uh, disrupted, like this. And because of this strong compression, the uh, nuclear burning of uh, just like supernova, and these uh, heavy elements are produced, and with an explosive phenomenon. So if this kind of uh, uh, phenomena are observed, then that's a strong indication that they, they are, they are this uh, black hole with this kind of mass. Because for bigger black holes, this kind of uh, disruption cannot happen because of this entire disruption uh, radius <coughs> and then the compact object radius ratio. So a white dwarf can be disrupted on, only by this uh, intermediate mass black hole. So this is a very promising thing. Finally, uh, only, the, uh, only very briefly, after light detection, uh, people or, say, uh, re thought or re-advocated the uh, primordial black holes with a variety of masses, so people are interested in this kind of reason as a possible uh, contribution to dark matter. But uh, by now, essentially, nearly all the mass ranges are closed. So there's really no way for any mass of primordial black holes to be a strong, the dominant contribution to dark matter. 
and even the recent observations even started closing these problems. So essentially, there could be a few or very few number of prime model black holes, but the, the whole dark matter explained as prime model black hole is very difficult according to a number of an array of observations. So uh, most likely we need to say the nature need to produce these black holes with a variety of masses uh, in an astrophysical way. Okay? So in the beginning, I tried to uh, say identify the origin of supermassive black hole, even like uh, reported yesterday, and I also explored a way to produce massive uh, <coughs> binary uh, stars. And then I talked a little bit about the existence or the detection of intermediate black hole and its prospects. And uh, thank you very much. For I have a very nice talk. I have two quick questions. The mm. first one about supermassive black hole. Okay. Um, so you mentioned this the uh, hypersonic turbulence mm. number density of those stars mm. are comparable to the red and so on as black holes. Yes. So we, we actually know the um, mass function of uh, black holes. So I was wondering that if the mass function of those hypergravity things sort of consistent with what we observe. The second quick question is the, about the second one, the filaments on the gradient of gravitational wave sources. Mm -hmm. If this is happening in million years of time scale, can this also explain the uh, billion or an black holes at a very high rate? Uh, okay, first question. This happens only in the so-called free sigma regions. So it's like literally like less than one percent, a very small region. But if we multiply this uh, probability with the number density of these mass scales, miraculously we get about one part of the person, two parts. The mass function, I think it's more, okay, it's not only a seal mechanism. I think this, uh, if we need to, uh, you know, we need to integrate this uh, from this uh, variety of seals to get to, you know, basically there must be a, a spectrum of these objects. And that's more like I feel the gross problem. And we can't really explain from the, say, the seed mass function to the final mass function. Mm -hmm. The second case, um, filament one, this is again a little bit peculiar condition, but uh, um, only up to, uh, say, 100 solar mass, you use, say, uh, massive end of the stellar mass black holes. I don't think these are the uh, very promising candidates as seeds for supermassive black holes. So I believe the, the observed supermassive black holes were really produced or started from a very peculiar conditions, just like our, our face. That's not, these are not like a, say, continued uh, low mass end of such object. So, but again, we need to fully explore this uh, from a very low to a high streaming velocity. I mean, statistical work. Okay, any other question? Oh, please. So, uh, one quick, very good question. So, for the first part of the talk, what is the driving source for those uh, super sonic velocity flow? Yes? Okay. Here, we only, okay, the, the, the essentially, I think I, I didn't say, I, I didn't emphasize. Uh, this point enough. For now, I know, we <laughs> focus on how we really form this kind of, say, massive object okay, as, a, as a source of the, the sea. And then uh, there are a variety of uh, possibilities, but we, the point is uh, here. Let's see. Just like this. <clears throat> Other than this cosmologically generated conditions, we don't need any. Uh, peculiar conditions. So we only, what we need is like a dark matter and the value of it, and this kind of motion. So if we ask what the source of this, and then that's a really cosmological initial conditions. Yeah. And any, any other things, you know, these are all like, uh, I would say, uh, should happen naturally out of this uh, prime order density fluctuations. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
and let me repeat one more short question. So in the last part when you talked about the high voltage options, yep. and you say that the temperature rise substantially to trigger nuclear yeah. nuclear synthesis. And then that is because uh, there are some shocks being generated during the fission? Ah yeah, the, the, uh, at the very moment, okay. So this is squashed. And uh, at this point, it's really like a, uh, generating a high speed radio inflow, and then that generates a shock wave to, to uh, ignite this uh, <coughs> nuclear synthesis. Okay, I just have to move the next speaker. So let's say it's a uh, speaker again. Thank you. The next speaker is Jia uh, Rui uh, Zhong, right? So he will talk about uh, holographic and technical.